Hello, welcome to Competitive Podcast. This is episode 12. With me today is David. Hi, guys. And I am Chris. Today we're going to talk about how to design a sideboard. But first off, what have you been playing, David? Uh, well, I've been doing a couple different daily events. Uh, the first one I did uh, recently was with the one land combo deck I brewed up. Uh, and posted on MTGO Strat if you're interested. Um, it's uh, a deck that has one land, you get it with uh, land grant, or uh, just some other force cycler, and then you get balustrade spy targeting yourself, and then if you have a conjurer's bobble in play, you can then target the misery, because you have no, you're haunting misery, which is in your graveyard, because you have no cards in your library shoots the misery into your hand, and then you can uh, shoot your opponent for a lethal amount, hopefully. Um, there's a few other like ways to do it, too, uh, that I don't need to go into here. But uh, Well, actually, there is one, because I do want to mention a story about this. Uh, there's another way to do it where if you have um, your forest out and your balustrade spy, and you have five mana, you can then cast Songs of the Damned, after you balustrades by yourself, get a bunch of mana. Uh, and then, this is a, a win I took from a guy named Oninaka, who I think was working with the similar deck. And uh, he had, uh, oh shoot, I'm forgetting what those cards are called, but it's a uh, oh, morgue theft. And you uh, flashback, there's two morgue thefts in your deck, and you flashback a morgue theft targeting. Um, his was Blood Celebrant and Monomic Wall. And then is the other Morgtef target. You bring those both back to your hands, play the Blood Celebrant, pay a life, play the Monomic Wall, get your Haunting Misery, and then shoot your, your opponent. <laughs> yeah. So it's like you do you have like a storm count of 10 before you go off. <laughs> uh, we figured out how to trim that a bit. So now... We just play. Well, we we just don't play the Blood Celebrant, but you can play Anarchist and get back a Simeon Spirit Guide. So that's a, a trim slot. But uh, something pretty funny happened in that daily where uh, I <laughs> my friend came over and he doesn't really like Popper, so I wanted to show him this deck because I figured he'd really enjoy this deck. So I'm going for the uh, the win this way with the uh, Songs of the Damned and. I duress my opponent. This is post sideboard, so I know it's game three. So this is for all the marbles. I duress my opponent. He has no counter spell, so I'm like, I'm going for it. So I go for it, and I have a Simeon Spirit Guide in my hand. And I think we had Anarchist at the time in the deck, so I have the kill if I want it. But then I flash just to show my friend how cool it is. I flash back all the stuff. And then I shoot my opponent, and I didn't count, and I did just 19 to him. <laughs> <laughs> so I just <laughs> lose on the spot. And then, uh, so I go 0-2, and then I play a third-round opponent, just for fun. Uh, and he's just talking trash to me the whole time, and he's playing his Orius Kitty. And uh, he, I, yeah, he's just talking complete smack to me. And he gained just enough life so that I couldn't beat him. Even and he had circle of protection blackout because he was oh. going to try to do that. And I got to cast flaring pain from the graveyard. <laughs> so he, he, I was my goal was to try just to get him to concede before I had to actually kill him with misery. Uh, and then, uh, sorry if that story was too long, but it's all right. Uh, the other deck I've been playing, of course, is the kitty deck. And uh, last night I three ones with with it, and I made a few changes with some spreading seas main again because I just love that card. I like that you can have a target that your opponent can't really interact with. So if they don't counter your your core sky fisher, you're going to draw a card. Yep. Um, as opposed to like Seagate Oracle, where there's been a few times when I cast Seagate Oracle on three, want to bounce him, but then the mono black opponent just kills it in response. And then I lose all my card drawing engine. So I really like that. And then Spreading Seas is just good against Tron. I mean, they just you just turn off a Tron piece and they have no flicker. So 
boom, your luck. Yeah, uh, Tron, Tron is really taking over, too. It's not me it's not taking over, but uh, sitting here looking at MTO stats, it's 9% of the meta now. So. Yeah, it's, it's a good deck. It's something you should be prepared for. When I looked at uh, Justin's statistics, uh, it's like a very significant portion of the meta in the last two weeks, but the way his counting works, like no one played it until a week ago. So <laughs> in yeah. like one week, it shot up exponentially. Um, so it became a force pretty quickly. And so it, one of the things about Tron is it crushes mid-range decks. And I'm, my source for this is a Vignan's article yep. at MTG Academy. And so I felt I needed to fight back because even though I'd never played against the deck going into this daily, I, I figured, you know, Spreading Seas has got to be good against it. And so I got to play. Round one, I played him. Uh, actually, round one, I played Hexproof and lost. Then Tron, and I crushed him. Uh, and then... What was my round three? I don't know. Can't remember. But my round four... Oh, my round three was Mono White. And he got three Guardians of the Guild packed against me. And I was able to serrated arrows them all down to, like, very low. Uh, and then he reset one. And so I realized I was screwed, looked up, and then realized he was going to time out. <laughs> so I won that one. And then... Uh, the last one, but I did win a mold of four game one on that one, and then the last one was uh, uh, Delver, and I beat him pretty handily. So it was a good night. Yeah. How about you? Oh well, I did. Uh, I did play some Delver. Been playing Delver. I've been taking Delver to dailies recently because uh, I just like the versatility of the deck, and I think it's actually really well positioned because of. You know, the way that Affinity is trying to beat you now is entirely different. And, you know, at the time when I started playing Delver more and more, was uh, it was about a week or so ago, where Affinity and Mono Black Control were number one and number two. Uh, so, played some Delver, and I went 3-1. I, I did a video, video of it, too. Uh, a daily event. List, post... Video. Why can't YouTubers. I talk? Check out my channel, Blue Collection. It's all about toy that problem too. Oh my god, I can't think at all. Um, so anyway, yeah, I took did a video or did four videos, I suppose, my daily event. I lost to Tron in round two. I uh, just got basically outvalued. Basically, the same way I lose one of our is it post was a thing. Same way I lost to them. They just you know they two for one me into oblivion, mole drifter, mole drifter. And then Fangard Marauder is just such a beating. If he manages to land Marauder against Delver against me, then um, you know, then I have to counter every single trinket, or else he gains five life, and I can't win. So that's basically what happened. Was he landed a Fangard Marauder? I think both games it was Fangard Marauder that really did me in. Um, but I do, do you feel good about that matchup? In the yeah, future? I usually I usually do. It's because they're. Their deck is so clunky, and you know you counterspell a few threats, and you, know, you counterspell the Mole Drifter, and you counterspell the Fangor Marauder. You should be fine. The problem with both of those is that you lose the spell setter effectiveness, and if they don't play into spell setter with like prophetic prisms and stuff, then you're basically playing a one-one flash, which isn't yeah. that good. Um, but yeah, they're, usually they're so clunky that if you can get a flip Delver or a Ninja on the table. And you just protect it through the removal. You're probably gonna win that game. So, um, yeah. And like I was t saying earlier about affinity, is it's just the way that the deck plays out now. It's it's almost like it's easy for me to beat. And most of the games that I'm playing against affinity, they're not even really close. I'm just I'm beating I'm beating them two zero. You know, if I draw even remotely well, I'm beating affinity two zero. And Mono Black Control has gone to relying so much on Grey Merchant that, you know, a single, a couple of counter spells, and you win that game. Uh, also helps that nobody's running on Earth anymore, so I don't have to worry about it. if I can counter spell the Kumbai Witches and keep them off the table, then I don't have to worry about them getting unearthed. So just protect my, protect the table from Kumbai Witches because I can't beat Kumbai Witches, and I think I win then. 
So yeah, three one Delver Daily. I posted the link. You guys can check it out. Uh, if you feel like you want to. So, you still gonna be playing as always, Kitty, in the upcoming week? I'm like, I'm pretty tired of it. Uh, <laughs> I kind of want to try some of the new decks I posted in my last article. Uh, my issue has been, like, I really want to play the Resilient Stompy list, but somewhere, and I was telling you about this, I traded someone all my Elves cards, and I <laughs> do not know who that person is. And so, if you are the person listening, I'd like those back, because I do want the Nettle Sentinels and Queer Rangers, and I know buying Snow-Covered Forests is going to be a process, but uh, I may just have to bite the bullet <laughs> just buy redundant copies. Yeah, well, if you want, I'm not probably not going to be using them, so I'll let you borrow my Metal Sentinels and Korean Rangers. The only time I ever use them is whenever I'm uh, frustrated and I go play Elves in the practice room. So, you know, because okay. I just want to yeah. kill people on turn four. Yeah, but I mean, I I think the Zorius <laughs> Kitty's a... I think it's a great choice. I mean, I obviously I've been saying that forever. Um, and the thing about it is it's just a, an adaptable deck. Like, that's why I think it's always a good choice. It's not that I think it's, like, overwhelmingly powerful or anything like that, but you can make so many, like, little changes to it to make it good against so much. Like, I, a lot of the matchups are 50-50, but if yeah. you tweak it, it's favorable. So if you're just prepared for the meta, you can can, can win with it. So I don't know. I think it's a good deck. Yeah, and I like <clears throat> I like the sideboard options that it gives you too. Uh, having access to both white and blue really allows you to be able to sideboard against anything. Yeah, I agree. The only matchup that I feel like is just straight unwinnable is the temporal fissure-ish familiar one and uh, sliver versus <laughs> is apparently unwinnable. But uh, aside from that, I, I like. There's no matchup I go into, and I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm a dog here. You still think Slivers is unwinnable? It's just hard. Um, yeah. and, and you could win against it. It would just require a lot of a lot of changes, like so much so that it would significantly alter the deck. So I would say Slivers and uh, and the Visualist Familiars or whatever. <laughs> yeah, the... Um, is there a name the Enchantment for... Um, a lot of names are being thrown around right now, but uh, I just like to call them all, like, Vigilous combo decks. Okay. I can actually beat the enchantment one. The creature one is harder. Ah. See, I lost the enchantment one. I played, uh, I did play some mono black control over the past weekend, and that's what, uh, <coughs> sort of made me go back over to Delver was. Uh, I played Mono Black Control, I beat Affinity Round 1, I beat Affinity Round 2. And, you know, those are not actually easy. The Perilous Affinity lists are actually about 50-50 for Mono Black Control. And uh, so what happened was I beat those two. I was like, alright, sweet, I'm going 2-0, going into Round 2, or going into Round 3, and I got paired up against Teachings, which is just an awful matchup for Mono Black Control. <laughs> uh, because they outcard you so heavily that uh, you just can't beat Teachings at all. I'm like, okay, that's not that's no big deal. I can't beat teachings, I'm okay with that. And so then I go into round four and I get I play against uh, the enchantment storm deck. I'm like uh, there's no way I can kill him fast enough. And he he can just sit there and hold all his dudes in his hand and wait to combo off until he has all the pieces. So that's what happened to me in round four. Uh, I did manage to get no keep gang in on like game one, I think, and you know, Okiba game just completely destroys him. It actually yeah. makes them act. Um, but, yeah, I lost that round anyway. So I was like, you know what? I'm not going to lose these decks. It's Because, I mean, both of these decks are just obviously preying upon Bottle Black Control at the time being number one. Uh, the Teachings and the, the Enchantment Storm decks. Uh, yeah. It's like Urzatron. It's like they're just preying on the number one. So it's like, you know what? I can't let you guys prey on... I can't play a deck that is being actively preyed upon. <laughs> yeah, I think that's... I mean, just, Justin just made a tweet the other day that for the first daily since the bannings, there was no showings of Mono Black. So yeah. 
I mean, that to me, that's just a testament of the fact that everyone's sort of in your mindset where. I, and I, I think if you look at the model black lists, they've like evolved. They're like, they started off, you know, this great killing machine, and now they're like altering themselves into like corrupt, corrupt Gary like blasts, and it's like these shifts are probably because other decks are coming in that are like attacking them on different angles. And now the old decks that they used to be are coming back and they don't have the pieces to beat those decks. So it's just, they're either playing a deck they're unprepared for or a deck they are prepared for, but it's still a bad matchup. <laughs> so it's, <laughs> I, I wouldn't want to play mono black, but I never really want to play the top decks anyways, unless it's Delver because Delver is just, I mean, Delver can just beat anything. Like, yeah. I really like my matchup against them, and but I still am like, well, if he goes Delver flip or, you know, Cloud of Fairies into Cloud of Fairies and then has Spell of Stutter and Counterspell the rest of the game, I just can't win. Yeah. That's so. usually how I beat. Uh, I actually did play Azorius Kitty the other day, um, in the daily that I recorded, and uh, I timed him out. <laughs> hmm. Um so I won game one, I think. Yeah, I won game one, you know, usual Delver Ninja beatdown plan. And game two, he sideboards in Circle of Protection Blue and Curse of the Bloody Tomb. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so I like that strategy. I, <laughs> it didn't work for one he wasted no. so much time trying to mill me out because he was only milling me for two. Like he managed to land the Curse of the Bloody Tomb because like I I didn't think about um the fact that he would be playing Circle of Protection Blue. Isn't so... <laughs> yeah, I, I just didn't think... Like, uh, nobody ever plays that card against me, so... Like, he played, like, a, a Core Sky Fisher or something, I'm like, well, I gotta counter that, right? So I counter the Core Sky Fisher, and then he, like... Like, he snap plays the Circle of Protection Blue. I'm like, well, fuck. How do I beat that? Because, <laughs> uh, you well, know... Only, the reason only... why I don't play it is because Spire Goal... That guy bashes me most of the time anyways. Yeah. Um, so I only have three Spire Golems in my deck now. And uh, so I played I played one of the Spire Golems, right? And I had Counterspell Protection. You know, I, I had one Counterspell Protection, but he had two Journeys to Nowhere, so... Like, okay, that's cool. And then, like, the next Curse of the Bloody Tomb mills that he did, he got, he had, like, two mills in a row, he got the my other two Spire Golems. <laughs> So I'm like, oh crap. Now I'm totally screwed. So I just waited and I waited and I waited and I, like eventually he milked me out, but his clock was at like a minute and a half. So I'm like, there's no way he's beating me in a minute and a half. It, it doesn't matter. So were you attacking into the circle of protection anyway? Oh yes, yes, definitely. <laughs> totally, totally trolling him, making him waste, because, you know, that... It takes a long it, time. Yeah, totally, it definitely does. So, you know, attacking the circle of protection blue and making him activate it nine times because I have... Uh, nine fairies on board. <laughs> yes, I know. I only run eight fairies in my deck, but I had nine of them on board. I was, I'm counting the ninjas as fairies. Pretty that's my fun. that's my plan against mono black sometimes, because um, I I actually I think the mono black matchups historically been like a cakewalk. I think I've lost one time to them, and the ways you can often lose to them is just they take out your dudes left and right. But they just can't beat a Circle Protection Black and a Curse of the Bloody Tome. And I know that that's what a lot of other people are doing too who pilot the deck. Yeah. Like, the only way they can beat that is if they Gary you. Or they yeah. clock, clock you out, I guess. <clears throat> but Garying is really hard to do because you can gain so much life. Yeah, uh, I say Gary and, I mean, if you have the Circle Protection Black, then Curse of the Obviously, a corrupt doesn't work, but um, I don't know that I agree with Curse of the Bloody Tomb there. Oh, who did you play? Uh, I think I just played more, more Zillion Threats, like sorry, uh, Stormbound Geist or uh, something along that nature. Probably Stormbound Geist. I yeah, that's a good one. Loyal Kathar would, would work too, but the reason I say that is because uh, every time I play Curse of the Bloody Tomb, I'm like, this doesn't actually do anything until, you know, turn 20. Sure. So, you're wasting a card, and you could be, you know, advancing a board state or, you know, whatever. And like, the Azorius Kitty player, if 
he hadn't uh, landed a circle protection blue against me, that Curse of Bloody Tomb would have actually done nothing, and I would have outcarded him. Well, that's an interesting sideboard discussion. <clears throat> Which does lead us into our main topic. Segway. Man, we're getting really good at this, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we're going to talk about uh, building a sideboard. Now that we spent 20 minutes talking about not building a sideboard. <laughs> um, so, David, I'm going to have you lead this discussion because you're definitely the brewer and the uh, generator of sideboards. I do like to do my own sideboard tweaking with lists that are already established. But So how do you go about building a sideboard? Well, uh, the first thing I like to do is uh, not build one. <laughs> so when I build a new deck, I I build the deck, and I focus on the deck, and I think about sort of what's going on in the like in in my deck, and I think about theoretically what am I going to lose to? You know, if I if I build a deck that is all circle protections and curse of the bloody tome. Well, I'm going to still lose to artifact creatures. And so I know that from a theoretical standpoint, my deck is weak to artifact creatures. It's probably also weak to enchantment removal, but I'm not sure I can do anything about that. Regardless, artifact creatures are like what I need to focus on. So if, I, if I'm in this theoretical step one uh, phase, what I'll probably do is like either have no cards to see if my theory is correct, or I'll just fill in with what I think is theoretically going to be a problem. And so I probably just put in a bunch of divine verdicts and stuff. Uh, if I was going to do anything at all. Um, but usually I just don't even add cards to the sideboard at this point, point because when I'm testing a deck like this, I'm probably like, there's a good chance this deck will be garbage, so why would I waste any thought process <laughs> on... On my sideboard plans, if I'm not even sure that my main deck can ever win a game, so, uh, so I just sort of start there and start playing, and this um, sort of moves me into what I call step two, which is just uh, testing for flaws. So you have your theory: I'm going to lose to artifact creatures, and that's it. That's all. Like I have tons of circle protections, first of the bloody tome. How could they possibly beat me with anything other than artifact creatures? Well, you start playing it, you start playing this deck, and you realize that sometimes they can actually get more creatures out than you can get lands out, something like that. So if they are a deck that has like a bunch of mole drifters or a bunch of Frixian Ragers and uh, Sign and Bloods, you might find yourself in a position where your opponent starts getting more creatures out than you have lands because they get to invest into creature resources each turn and then untap and then play more stuff, whereas you're stuck playing just one land a turn. So you might start seeing this is the reality of your deck and that maybe you need some sort of creature removal in the sideboard to, to beat this plan. Or maybe you realize that the mono black deck actually can't outpace your land count, but they can play Gary and they can just sit there and not attack you the entire time, and then just kill you with a Grey Merchant of Asphodel for, like, 20. Yeah. And so you need to actually add some life gain or something. Yeah, so, like, backing up, I like to, you know, the, you said you like to build the main deck first, and I, I totally agree. Uh, one of the things that I like to focus on with the main decks is, can I beat any given deck with the right draws, and if they stumble on mana? That's another big one that I like to play is with my type of decks is if they stumble on mana, can my deck punish that? And I don't like playing decks that can't really punish opponents stumbling because opponents will stumble, especially in Popper, where all mana bases are greedy. I mean, you guys can say whatever you want, but the mana bases in Popper are all greedy. And if somebody stumbles on mana, and you need to be able to capitalize on that with your main deck. Uh, the other thing that I like to, to make sure of is, can I, is it feasible for me in game one to beat any deck? Uh, the, the grand example of this I like to shout out to is like Burn, right? So you have two different 
ways of beating burn, you can interact with them and stop their burn spells from happening with things like duress or counterspell. Uh, or you can race them like what you do with Stompy. Um, so I want to be able to have that available to me in game one before I even start worrying about the sideboard. Sometimes decks are so good that you need to be able to uh, not worry about that in game one, but like let's say with Fissure, right? Fissure was so good that you didn't necessarily need to worry about losing game one because you had such a consistent win engine. But um, I do like to have that available to me. Okay. What do you think about step two? Um, step two. So you said here, you know, theoretical weaknesses are not as necessarily the actual weaknesses. Yeah. So this is like my thoughts about like, you know, maybe with the circle of protection deck, the the real weakness you have is that people can outpace your land count. So you need like, or or maybe the real weakness is that people can drain you instead of deal damage to you. So you fi you figure this out after playing. Like maybe you should have realized that draining would be a problem from a theoretical perspective, but you didn't figure it out until you sat down and played the deck. Um, and so then at that point you start to fill in the weaknesses where you start like, you know, maybe you add. What I did for that particular deck was I added life burst because if you have enough life bursts in your deck, you will actually gain more life than they deal with carries. Like, period. I think if I did my math right. So yeah, didn't we didn't we play a game where uh, or something like that happened, where it was a uh, you had life burst or something and oh, what did I do to? Kill your life first. I think I had like a fairy macabre in my deck. And oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I fairy macabre your life first, so that like if you had had one more turn, or if that life first hadn't had happened the way that you wanted it to, there was no way that what I was, was winning. That? But yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, I do remember. Yeah, I think that's exactly what it was. Something like that, where my plan was because I had brainstormed and I needed to really get to the next card. But I knew Life Burst would just fog, or I thought it would, so I just didn't really care. I was like, I'll just wait a turn and not deal with this Life Burst later. And, yeah. uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah work. So sometimes your strategies, like, your counter strategies are going to be countered by your opponent, I guess is what I'm getting at there, because uh, I think you were playing, I think you were playing your Tron Mill or something, one of your crews, and... Uh, you know, I had a whole bunch of creature removal, but I was like, you know what, that doesn't actually do anything against your deck, so uh, I had these, like, two fairy macabres in the board, might as well bring them in, because they're, they're just additional threats, and maybe I can get something out of your graveyard. So I brought in the fairy macabres, and it turns out they actually saved me the game, so it yeah. was purely an accident, but <laughs> <laughs> sometimes uh, <laughs> yeah, so go. sometimes your, your plants get thwarted. Uh, <clears throat> but Usually in this in this part of the plan, I feel like it's not so much like you realize that Gray Merchant the Bass Fidel is the problem because usually you're not paying that much attention. You're just like, I lost the Mono Black, why? And then you play a bunch more. And you're like, I lost the Mono Black some more, and then you're like, this is must be a bad matchup. I don't really know why, but it is. And I, I feel like that's sort of the initial level people have with the with the matchup. So. That's kind of the thing you're also testing for at this stage, is you're like, what are my good and bad matchups? You don't necessarily need to know why, but that's, that's something. See, I think, I think knowing why is extremely important. I think uh, so, too. I just don't think you need to know why yet. Okay. So, and uh, one of the things that you can do there to help yourself out is keep a, spread, uh, keep a spreadsheet of your de the way that how your deck really matches your deck is winning and losing. And that's something I've started to do recently, and it's how I tweet illusory tricks so that I can win with it. Um, so I've got these spreadsheets, and I think I've shared this one with you. That, um, yes, I have. The spreadsheet for illusory tricks, where you know I started to learn, and I wrote notes on each matchup on how I lose. So, uh, what was I thinking here? 
there was a segue and I was going to go away. So. Okay, so yeah, on my Illusory Tricks deck, I, there was notes that I had made on each on anything, on everything. Uh, one of the notes I was making was I played three rounds of against like, blue-black control. I'm not sure if they were, I think I just looped teachings into everything here. But I played three rounds of blue-black control, and the notes that I wrote were uh, that I needed, basically I just needed to draw better. You know, draw a ton of, I drew a ton of cards, got super flooded. Deep analysis helps here, but perhaps mold drifters be more useful since they come with a body attached. And that's sort of how I went from deep analysis in the sideboard to mold drifters in the sideboard. It was because, you know, I drew all these cards with deep analysis, but it didn't matter because they weren't actually threats. You know, I drew four lands off of the deep analysis or something. Deep analysis is flashback, and I was like, well, that doesn't actually do anything. But if those were mold drifters, then I could have been beating down and actually won a couple of those games. So, yeah, keep notes. Uh, also, fuck slivers. <laughs> yeah, they are the worst. Um, okay, so, I, yeah, I mean, I think the notes are a great way to uh, figure out what you're bad against and why you're bad against them. And uh, those are both extremely important to know when you're developing a cyborg, because I think a lot of people, I've been working with several some people these days and they are some of them are different ranges of experience and some of them tell me you know uh, we should have X, Y, and Z in the sideboard to deal with digressive mashups and it's like why? You know like we are extremely good against those matchups why are we, why would we dedicate any sideboard space to matchups we're really good against um, or like just very obscure things, and they'll they'll be like, we should cut all... So, like, for instance, in the one-land combo deck, I'm working with uh, Obzin, and he he recommended not uh, keeping the... Uh, uh, what are they called? The 3-3 three, three Evoke guy who destroys an artifact. Ingature. Uh, when he comes into play. Yeah, Ingature, the sideboard, and replace it with something else. And, and I don't think that that's, like... Uh, a terrible choice to like take get rid of it or whatever, but one of the things I don't like doing is playing a deck that instantly loses to a single card. And if we don't have Relic of per- or if we don't have Ingotchu, we instantly lose to Relic of Progenitus. And so, uh, like, there, there's things of, about that. And I think he wanted to bring an Ancient Grudge, but if we have Ancient Grudge, so like we like mill ourselves and then try to grudge the Relic. From a theoretical standpoint, that doesn't work because, in response, they'll uh, just remove our graveyard. <laughs> yeah. So you have you have to do it before you go off, and uh, it's stuff like this that you figure out through, you know, like from a if you sit back and think about it from a theoretical standpoint, and you sit, or if you miss it at that point, once you start playing it, you realize, you know, ancient, ancient grudge isn't going to work here. We need to have a pre act pre. Uh, or proactive answer to take out these artifacts before they blow up our graveyard. And the great thing about Ingotchure is it's a creature for haunting misery, and uh, you can set it up such that uh, you blow up their artifact before the Ingotchure goes in the graveyard. And we have Spring Leap Drum, so you can do it all net neutral and mana. So um, it's stuff like that that you you figure out through like experience in playing the deck that, you know, the the reason why we need the artifact removal is early on. But it makes sense to think ancient, we can play one Ancient Grudge and get rid of a Relic of Progenitus. Why would we have to play four Ingot Jurors and dedicate four Cyborg slots to that? And that's something yeah. you figure out through playing. So, uh, anyways... That was probably a bit of a tangent, but uh, this, the third step I wanted to talk about is applying the general answers to your sideboard. So, like, once you realize that, you know, affinity is a bad matchup, you don't. I don't think at this point it's necessary to understand why it's a bad matchup. I mean, if you do know why, that's great. But I think for a lot of beginners, it's it's like, I know I'm losing to this deck. What do I do? And this is where you start. You know applying, like, Ancient Grudge. You start applying, I guess, Ingatchu or things like that, where you're like, this should beat Affinity. Um, 
because it's just like a blanket. So it should help my affinity matchup. And then you can test those general answers. So like Hydroblast is probably the most well-known general answer. That card just beats red cards. And it's good against red cards, all of them. Or like Circles of Protection are great general answers. So I feel like your sideboard at this point should go from like zero cards or like just your theoretical cards to a combination of your theoretical cards and your general blanket answers for the deck, the matchups you're bad against. <clears throat> yeah, and you can actually sort of start delving into specifics there. Like, if you lose to Affinity and you realize that nine times out of ten you lose to Affinity because they fling a, a giant Atog at you, then that's you can uh, apply a more general answer to that. You know, and that's just sort of in your playtesting, it's like, uh, well, you know what, I was fine against Affinity until he played an Atog and flung it at me for 26. Yep. I think that's that's a great one. Yep. So, uh, do you have any specific general answers you'd like to go to? Uh, obviously Hydroblast, I do like to. <laughs> I do like to completely crush Cyclops. But... As, obviously, if I'm, that's only if I'm playing blue decks. But I do like to have, you know, make sure that the free win decks in the format aren't allowed to get free wins. <clears throat> but I want them to be able to uh, force them to have the Apostle Blessing. So I will make sure that if I'm playing white, I have four Journey to Nowhere in my deck. If I'm playing black, I have, you know, a ton of removal. If I'm playing red, I want Flame Slashes. Uh, and those are all, like, 100% for sure that I will not let free win decks get free wins. They have to work for their they have to work for their combo win that kills me on turn three or four. What colors do you think have the best like general answers? Um white is obviously like just the best sideboarding color. However, I think next to that is probably blue. Because blue has so many ways to deal with so many different things, like Curse of Chains deals with big big creatures, and you know, Serrated Arrows can deal with weenies, and Coral Nets can deal with white and green. So it's like it's got hate for pretty much everything except for black. <clears throat> so, uh, and your hate for black is basically counter spells or dispels. Okay, yeah, that's sweet. Uh, so, do you feel like green is the worst? Cyborg color? I think I so. It's green. It's got to be green or red, right? I mean, red can deal with artifacts via ingot chewers, but. I think red is sweet. Like, myself. I, I, I love red. You have your you have your counter to the Hydro Blast. You have your Pyro Blasts. You have your Gorilla Shamans. You have other sick answers in, like, Ancient Grudge. Um. What else do I like in red? I guess those are kind of the main like blanket answers that I enjoy. Yeah. You also have things like Smash the Smithereens, which are yeah. you know, which is really cool. It's like a Doom Blade you oh, by the way, you also get all three damage. Oh, and land destruction stuff, of course. Yeah. Like that's just a feature that's only in red, black, or green. And so and and yeah, but... only three mana and one color at red. I mean one color symbol. So like Stone Rain is as opposed to like Rain of Tears. Yeah. Even though Rain of Tears is I guess not a common law. Uh, so I never heard of that. <laughs> never heard of that card. By the way, speaking of uh, financial tips uh, from Dan were basically by land destruction because of Tron. So by raises and choking sands and whatnot. Small segue there. That was the financial tip of the week, folks. Dan, <coughs> Dan couldn't be with us this week, so he said, uh, buy land destruction because Tron is, is a thing. And Earth Rifts are really cheap right now. Okay. Anyway, back to the subject. Uh, um, but I guess we can move on to the next part. Uh, so, like, once you have... So, step four is, you know, once we have our general answers in our sideboards, our pyroblasts, our hydroblasts, our standard pairs, stuff like that, we start testing more. And so I think the chief example I have in my life of this start of, like testing phase is uh, 
with Simic Stormpost and I was developing that deck, um, Fangren Marauder came to mind only after I tried a bunch of different answers to Affinity. Like, I kept losing to Atog plus Fling or Atog plus Disciple. It wasn't like uh, I was like I was losing to Affinity. I was losing to that combo of cards. And so I realized, you know, I have to figure out some way to beat that that's more specific. And so once you start testing out these these weird situations that develop in in the games, uh, you you start to realize that you know these general answers are not good enough. I need to come up with a very specific answer to a very specific set of problems in order to, to actually make this matchup a good one. And so this is the, the point where you're just testing a, a bunch. Like, the main reason why I think like general answers will get you a long way, and it's not super important to understand why you're losing, is because, I mean, to figure out really why you're losing to someone takes a long time. And so you like general answers need are going to be in your sideboard development process for a while. Like I, I say often, you know, making a deck takes a day, making a sideboard takes a month, and a big part of that is going to have a big part of that month is going to be you using just general answers to to decks you're having trouble with. So um, this testing phase would be about like two or three weeks in, where you're just testing out your general answers to see how effective those are. Um, and if they're not, that's that's when you should really be keeping track, in my opinion, of what you're losing to and why. Yeah. So there's some specific answers that are, I guess, some development of sideboards that I've been doing recently, like uh, four coral nets, right? That should beat slivers, but it doesn't. <laughs> four coral nets doesn't even begin to beat slivers. Uh so I, I keep referencing this illusory tricks deck that I've been playing, and I'm currently one in three against slivers. I think that's actually like one in four. I just forgot to record one, but I'm bringing in two serrated arrows and four coral nets, and it's just not enough to beat slivers. So there's some points where your general answers just aren't going to be good enough, and you need to start thinking about how else to do it. I haven't figured out how to beat slivers with illusory tricks yet, but uh, if I ever find a way, I'll let you know. <laughs> Yeah, I lost to them too with that. Um, so I think one thing we could do is is look at a couple deck lists uh, just from a random daily and, and talk about some of their specific answers. Um, okay. And, and so like step five is, you know, developing those. So like for my blue-green Fissure deck, the specific answer to Autoc plus Fling was Fanger and Marauder. You know, it's very difficult for them to win once you get Fanger now. Because if they sacrifice an artifact, you gain five life. So if they have two disciples and a fling, every time they sacrifice an artifact, they'll do. That's like the equivalent of adding four damage to you, but you gain five life. So it's very difficult for them to to win if there's a fangrid. Sure, they can pass to your turn and do some stuff with the way the triggers happen, but um, it's it's difficult for them. So. Uh, that was like my specific answer. So if we look at some decks on here, um, you can sort of tell specific answers because a lot of the times people have no idea why you're running the card. So uh, there's a 4 0 list by this guy named Golgari Longlegs. It's a mono black okay. list. Okay. And he has a singleton mind rot and a singleton murder in the sideboard <laughs> and two shrivels. Which I think are very interesting. I have no idea why the mind rot's there. There must be a reason. Uh, but I don't want to get into that. The murder, I have a, I have a suspicion about. That. Okay. I think that that is for Fangren Marauders. Um, you need good ways to deal with those guys immediately if you're the mono black player, and he only has uh, Obulets and Doom Blades as his two... Well, I guess he has victims at night, too. So I guess he just wants additional copies of that. So maybe that's not as specific of an answer as I thought. But the shrivels have got to be a very specific answer. Yeah, I think I think the murder actually might be a specific answer to Grey Merchant, to opposing Grey Merchants. That could be, because yeah. Because Victim and Doomblade don't kill Grey Merchants, but murder does. 
Yeah. Uh, again, like I said, it's very difficult to know exactly what sideboard slots are for sometimes. Yeah. But I think your guess is probably a lot better than mine. So. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the mind rot, I think, as the more I play wrench mind, the more I realize that most decks have a couple different artifacts that can pitch to your wrench mind. So mind rot being, yeah, you're just discarding two. That's the way this is working right now. And waiting an extra turn for the for the wrench mind, I don't think it's correct because the for curve considerations, you really want to cast wrench mind on turn two. People cast a rat on turn three or a rager, but. Uh, this is decent, and Mind Rock is going to be a replacement for Wrench Mind if you can't find Wrench Mines. And that could be it, too, is he just couldn't find Wrench Mines off of any bots. Well, what do you think about the Shrivels? What are those for? Uh, shrivels are for Hexproof, actually. They're. Uh... So, what happens often with Hexproof is they'll have uh, like three or four Sylphana Ledgewalkers, slash Bogle, slash Hexproof dudes. And they'll chant one up like crazy, right? The Voltron one up, and your verdicts and your edicts become significantly less good if they have six dudes on the board. So you shrivel away, you kill all their dudes, and you know problem solved. Uh, also, shrivels are just insane against Delver if they, you know, if you can catch two cards off of a Delver off of a Delver player like, you know, a Delver and a Cloud Fairies is two for one. Most of the time it's getting countered, but you know that time when it slips through, then you're in a really good spot against Delver. That makes sense to me. So I have a, a great list to look at for this discussion, actually. If you scroll down to some old guy who uh, threw one, this is uh, a list I actually referenced in my article um, because I feel like this guy's teachings list is the teachings <sighs> list. Um, if you want to play it, he's put up con consistent results um, in a lot of dailies, and this deck just looks beautiful to me, like, just as an aside, the Monomic Wall, uh, Ghostly Flicker, Chittering Rats combo, having access to that is awesome, and he's got great, uh, no great numbers to make sure that actually happens throughout the course of the game. Um, yeah. I see he cut some Ravenous Rats, which is kind of unsurprising to me, It's a bit underwhelmed with them from just like a theoretical standpoint. but uh, They're always the worst card in your deck. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think Seagate's... I think... I don't know if he had Seagate's before. I can't really remember. But regardless, that's not what we're talking about. I think this deck is great. But the interesting thing is the sideboard. So like, when you have a deck that's <laughs> uh, focused on silver bullets and you have a, a sideboard with a bunch of one-ofs, these are clearly, by definition going to be specific answers. Like, this coffin, Singleton Coffin Purge, I have I have some speaking, sus some, some suspicions that this is for, you know, uh, your, fissure, your Fissureless Familiars deck, so that if they're trying to go off on you, you can kill off a flicker, and then hopefully kill their wall or whatever piece they have. Yep. But I'm not sure about that. Uh, so, like, Dispel and Negates, I would consider very broad, non-specific answers. Um, but Repeal and Undying Evil and Whale of Nim are all pretty specific, in my opinion. Um, yeah, definitely. I don't know what the Repeal is for. Maybe it's probably on board permanents that Black and Blue can't deal with, so, like, enchantments or artifacts. Uh, those or two. even things like tortured existence that squeak by on turn one. Yeah. That you couldn't counterspell. That's definitely possible. I think I would rather have a recoil myself. Yes. Because then recoil if you this deck can can get your opponent uh, to hellbent, so they have no cards in hand. So I feel like if that's something your deck can do, you really want a recoil, because then recoil is vindic it's an instant speed vindicate. So yeah. I'd, I'd want access to one of those, I think. But uh, the Whale of Nim must probably be for the Hexproof Mirror, like <laughs> you were saying, because it's got a lot of similarities to the uh, Nausea or whatever the version of that was. Yeah, and it's it's instant speed, so you can teaching it up. Yep. Um, so I, I, 
you can see that in this. I have no idea what the Undying Evil's for. <laughs> probably mono black, but... Uh, probably just he can do, like, sweet Moldrip for Undying Evil champions. Yeah, no, but I just wonder, like, why he... Why... What matchup would he be like, this is the one I want to do shenanigans in? <laughs> but no others. I have no idea. I know that uh, when I played against Teachings with Mono Black Troll, they brought in Undying Evil against me, so maybe it's just for Mono Black Troll, they just want to get you. You know, you try to victim, or they try to victim your Moldrip, for you just Undying Evil it and crush them. Sure. <sighs> uh, so that those are some, like, general and specific answers you can see. Like, he, he also has Hydro Blasts in the sideboard. And I later on, I'll come back to this list, because he has a feature that I want to discuss, too. Um, but, uh, so those are the specific answers. Um, and so, do you want to go into talking about, like, figuring out plans and numbers and stuff? Um, yeah, sure. So, one of the things that a lot of people don't really fully grasp is the constraints that your design decision about your deck have upon your sideboard, and vice versa. So, Deluxikov, um, who works with our site a lot, his sideboards often are 4-4-3 four, four, in terms of numbers. So, he'll have, uh, you know, like four Gleeful Sabotage, four Standard Bears, um, four Moments Piece, and three something else in his... because his decks are very aggressive and have very little card drop. And so if you're running a deck that can't dig too deeply into your deck, you probably want to have access to four copies of it so you have a high probability chance of drawing it. Um, on the other hand, if you have a deck that draws a bunch of cards, you can start playing one ofs and two ofs in your deck, right, in your sideboard, because you can actually find them. So the Vignon, in his article about uh, Urzatron, was talking about how he has like miser copies of Ancient Grudge and miser copies of uh, the enchantment one. Ray of Revelation. Yeah, Ray of Revelation. Uh, and he feels like they're sufficient. And it's because that deck really draws a lot of cards. They, they draw a ton from their stars and their spheres. They have Mold Drifters, Seagate Oracle. So it's actually not that difficult to find a one of in those slow control decks. So your design constraints of your deck actually dictate the amount of your numbers that you have on your sideboard to some extent. Um, one thing I like to say when designing a deck is, you know, if with no card draw included in your design philosophy, you're, if you have a four of in your deck, you're going to see it in the top 15 cards of your library. If you have, like, on average, right? And if you, yes. if you have three, you're going to see it in the top 20 cards of your library. Well, keep that in mind when you're designing your sideboard, too, because if you're like, this in my 443 sideboard, I'll have this be my three. Well, the three should be something you'd be okay with drawing one of in the top 20 cards of your library. So in an average aggressive deck with little card draw, uh, it'd be a card you'd be fine seeing by turn 13 if it goes that late. So that's why you want the the, the four of, because it really maximizes your chance of, of getting it if you're an aggressive deck. So that's important. Another thing you can do is you can do uh, what I call sideboard split, which if we go back to some old guy's list, um, you'll see that he has a singleton deadweight in his main deck and two deadweights in the sideboard. Which seems kind of weird, because, like, why would you want just one deadweight in a teaching deck? Because you can't find the teachings. I mean, you can't find the deadweight with it, with the teachings. But part of it is because he's hedging. So he's got part of his three of deadweights from his sideboard is actually in his main deck. So you can change the 443 composite um, in your aggressive deck to something less if you in incorporate some of the sideboard cards into your main deck already. So that's one thing to be thinking about. The other thing is, you know, as you're playing these games, what are you taking, what are you putting into your main deck and what are you taking out? You know, if, if you come up if, and you are playing against Affinity and you bring in 10 artifact destruction spells, 
well, do you have ten cards from your main deck that you can take out to to and your deck will still function properly? Like just having ways to interact with your opponent's plan is not enough at this point. At this point, you should be figuring out the exact number of those things you need and what cards you want to move around or are okay taking out of your deck. Like, this teaching this deck, some old guys, he, he must, with these one ups he must be sliding them in in various spots. So, like, if he's bringing in a uh, Whale of Nim, he's probably also taking out... Probably, I would probably take out Soul Manipulation or something like that, you know? Because you don't want to take out your Mystical Teachings. You can't take out your Creature Package. Stuff like that. And you have to figure these numbers out through playing. So that was kind of a, a long ramble. But hopefully uh, hopefully it wasn't that boring. So No, that's um, totally right. And you have to figure out too... <clears throat> part, of, part of figuring out your sideboard is figure out what what cards are bad against specific matchups? I know there was a, there was a matchup where I saw <coughs> I was watching a, a video from Chris Davis of uh, Channel Channel Fireball. He's doing a popper video and he was playing a mono black deck, and he took out Chittering Rats against Stompy, and I was like, that is not right. Chittering Rats is actually actually just completely insane against Stompy because the way that your deck. Uh, compares against theirs, the way that your deck plays against theirs. If you're a mono-black player, you remove all their threats, and they're stuck with a handful of pump spells. So your Chittering Rat becomes Time Walk after Time Walk after Time Walk, and so you should never remove certain cards against certain decks, because you have to know what cards are good against certain matchups. <clears throat> uh, so I guess that's the other thing is uh, going back to illusory tricks is you need to know when I'm playing illusory tricks I, I have to learn I had to learn through testing which cards are good in certain matchups and which cards are really bad so uh, the original list had piracy charms and I realized that piracy charms are pretty much bad in every matchup but they're also a good sideboarding target right because they're 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 not great in any given matchup except maybe against, like, Delver, but they are really good as just something to, to target for sideboarding. Do you have anything like that in your uh, any of your lists that are pretty much there as a placeholder? Uh, yeah, I guess uh, one of the... In the new combo list I have, uh, I have those uh, I think Deadshot Minotaurs, and their sole purpose in the main deck is just to cycle. You know, I... I which is obviously, like, I don't want this card in my hand. I just would rather have another card. I'll pay one mana so I can have a different card every single time. And so when I go to sideboarding, I look to take those guys out, usually. Um, obviously, I need to keep my creature count high, so and that's why they're in there at the beginning. So you have to pay attention to that. But, uh, yeah, so, I mean, there's, there's definitely things in my deck that I'm looking to take out, uh, more often than not, and I get that feeling once I play the deck a lot. Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, I actually had one more thing I wanted to talk about, too, with this stuff, and I'm trying to remember what it was. Um, hmm. Do you have anything else? I'll see if I can remember it. Yeah, um, I guess the other thing that I want to talk about a little bit is, you, talk, you talked about one-ofs and stuff, and, uh, in the sideboard of aggressive lists that have no card draw. So I'm going to go reference the uh, generic Stompy list. Um, let's see if I can find one that actually has it. That is a specific one of in the sideboard, but it's brought in sometimes. All right. Well, I can't find a specific list right now, but sometimes with aggressive lists, you have a one or a two of in the deck, and like you can't really reasonably expect to draw that, but there are sometimes cards that you bring in, like say for example, if you're playing Stompy and you have two Viridian Longbows. Now, Stompy's plan generally just doesn't change, right? But from uh, pre and post sideboard, you're still playing, I'm going to beat you down. That's the whole plan of the deck. But you bring in Viridian Longbows to hedge against decks like uh, Delver or, you know, decks with one toughness things. <coughs> and Viridian Longbow is 
you'd like to draw one, but if you don't, your game plan isn't that badly affected. So, and sometimes these one or two ups are just better than other cards in your deck, like say Mutagenic Growths or uh, Gather Courage. Um, so you bring in these one or two ofs that if you draw them, great. If not, that doesn't matter that much because your game plan didn't change actually. So I guess that's what I have to say about Miser's copies and well, aggressive non-card drawing decks. I think you, you highlight something too, which is <coughs> sometimes your deck um, doesn't have like, sometimes your sideboard doesn't have perfect options, but your main deck has some very bad things. And so, what you basically said was, sometimes you want to have a two of in your sideboard, because sometimes you need to take these bad cards out of your main deck and put in something else that's slightly better. And I think that that's a totally valid explanation for why aggressive decks sometimes have sideboards that aren't four four threes, and that's something you you have to figure out through playing. I don't necessarily advocate the four four threes for aggressive decks. I don't necessarily advocate just five threes either. I guess I just wanted to highlight that that's uh, the rationale there. And if you if you want a high impact sideboard card, something that's like going to turn your game around instead of just like mitigate a bad card in your deck, then you really want to have it be a four four three or a three three of in your sideboard. Um, yep. Because then you, because then you'll draw it. Um, but if you're in that situation you were describing, it's like, well, I'd rather have a Viridian Longbow than this other garbage card. You know, that's that's a very different story. You can run two ofs or one ofs in that instance as well. Um, yep. There's a lot of. This is a type of thing where I think that there's no right answer to designing your sideboard. There's. Uh, it's more like uh, there's a bunch of different like theories on sideboard development, and if you have a good reason for why you're doing what you're doing, and it and you're actually going to draw it, then I, I say whatever, that's okay. Um, so the oh the other thing I want to talk about, I remembered it now, is understanding the aspects of the play and the draw too. Um, so with illusionary tricks. I sideboard differently all the time, depending on if I'm on the player of the draw, because we have dazes. Daze yes. is is like daze is probably a top. I'm going to say top five card in the format on the on the play, but a terrible card on the draw. Um, and and I feel this way, and maybe uh, maybe you don't feel the same way as me, but I feel this way because if I can go Delver go. With days back up, that is just like the best feeling in the world. Because if I have another one drop in my hand, if they try to kill my Delver, I can just counter it and then go again. But sometimes yeah. days is just the worst. Because if you're like, if they go turn one, uh, Nettle Sentinel, and you're like, and, and then they say go, and then you don't have a one drop, but you have a days in your hand, you you can't counter their two drop because if you do, then that nettle sentinel is just going to keep bashing you, and you're going to have to return the highland to your hand and then redo the same turn. So by the yes. time you get your second drop, they'll have three mana out. So you're just so far behind. Um, it, so I think I cut a lot. I shave more dazes when I'm on the draw, and sometimes last time I played illusionary tricks, actually, I had a spare daze in the sideboard so I could bring it in if I was ever on the play. So, uh, you have to be keep that stuff in mind, too. Sometimes cards are a lot, a lot better on the play or the draw. Uh, another famous one is Raze. When I played a lot of goblins, combo goblins against Fissure decks, uh, Raze is really good on the play and really bad on the draw for very similar reasons to Days. Yeah, the land development setback is just too big on the draw. Yeah, exactly. See, uh, but then you can also like sort of reverse engineer that as uh, if your opponent is not expecting you to play days on the draw, like, and I, I fall victim to this too. I think my opponents are going to sideboard certain things out that they don't. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've lost to Hunger of the Howl Pack as a double player. 
And I'm like, you can't play that card against me. It's actually bad. And they just didn't sideboard it out. So I didn't play around it, and I lost because an opponent didn't sideboard how I thought they were going to sideboard. Well, that's that's sort of like the counter argument of like, you know, so if if your opponent has you, uh, like their correct play is to attack with everything, to put you at one so that they can, uh, you know, then it like beat you the following turn, and they just don't do that, or they like, or what's the famous thing that uh, that uh, PV talked about? I think it was he used this example where it's like. The correct play is to like attack you and attack you, but your opponent like pyroclasms their board and just like kills all their guys. Like that clearly seems like totally wrong to us. But then let's say that like ultimately results in them winning. Well, like they did something bad, you know, like that they did the incorrect play, but it resulted in them winning, you know, and that's that's how I feel like how your explanation of the sideboard strategy works. Like your opponent leaves their dazes in on the draw. That's just stupid. You know, it's just... I mean, maybe they'll win because of it, but I. it's just... it's not a good thing to do. And same with this Hall of the Hunger Pack thing. It's like, yeah, it could happen, but if they're doing it, that's just stupid. I don't know. It's, yeah. not, it's not a good thing. It's unintelligent. So that's my two cents on it. Like... So Daze isn't always bad on the draw, though. I just usually keep one in. <sighs> yep. It's so it's reasonable to keep one uh, one Daze in always because you will sometimes just get people on random turns with it, and you don't necessarily have to bounce the land. Sometimes it's just uh, you know a bad mana leak, which is what I often I cast Daze as a bad mana leak more often than I than I like to admit. <laughs> but sometimes that's just what it is. Yeah, I hard cast it whenever I can. <sighs> yeah, it's but like on the draw. Here's a here's a good example of where Days is good on the draw. Is you play your second land and they play their third land and they play Kumbai Witches and they have unearth backup. Then Days is actually really good because you can counter spell the Kumbai Witches and then also Days the unearth. So I know that's one situation that's happened to me more than once. But hey, mono black control players aren't running on Earth anymore, so go me. No need to play it. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> I guess that would be the situation where you figure that out. Where I guess in the mono black matchup, you don't take out all your dazes on the draw, you know? Yeah. But so that that was just kind of my example of that is the level of sideboarding knowledge I think is is really important to to know. Um, Oh, and I guess the last thing. This is this is honestly the last thing. Uh, stuff by feel. I think sideboarding by feel is still important, even at um, these high levels when you have sideboarding guides. Like I know Dan is a big advocate of sideboarding guides, uh, but sometimes you just can't rely on that for everything because sometimes your opponents aren't doing the stock thing. You know. Uh, so, I guess one one thing I saw in a, in a Vignan's article is he he's like you know I sometimes I bring an ancient grudge against Delver but it's totally about what I see out of them you know if they have if I just see Spire Golems I don't bring them in but if in game two I see Spire I see four copies of Spire Golem Bone Splitter and Serrated Arrows you can sure as hell bet I'm bringing in the ancient grudge in game three you know and it's like it's stuff like that. You want a little bit of fluidity in your sideboarding plans because sometimes people do unexpected things um, or have weirder lists than than what's the norm. And so you need to allow yourself this this flexibility. And I think that's more like a magic instinct than anything. Um, but it's it's important to know. So like actually, this four L Delver list with has pester mites instead of spell setters, or I mean instead of uh, Spire Golem, so it's like if you are on this plan to always bring an Ancient Grudge against Delver decks, like you have just brought in a terrible card against them, a card that actually does nothing. You can flash That's back a card good. that does nothing if you want. So you need to have so, this 
flexibility also. So there are very specific uh, cards that you normally hate on whenever you sideboard, and that's a really good example, like this by this green, by this uh, four list green printing, where he's not running Spire Golems. I'm not sure what exactly his reasoning is there, but he's just not running them. I think it's just so that he can be more aggressive with Pestermites, but uh, yeah, he's not running Spire Golems, so if my opponent brought in Ingot Chewers or Ancient Grudges, then those are just dead cards in his hand. Mr. Green Printy has just got an edge on his opponent by, you know, uh, what does it call it? Next leveling his opponents. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I guess that's the last thing I wanted to say, is that even though eventually we get these these uh, rigid sideboard plans, it's still sometimes just correct to go with your gut and go with what you've seen. Um, I'll make decisions based on how my opponent is playing sometimes. Last night, I had a, a Delver player, like my round four Delver player, was playing more aggressive than I've ever seen before. And so I left in some additional removal because I knew... You know, this guy taps out more than any Delver player I've ever seen. So, <laughs> this stuff's going to land. And so, like, you can make sideboard decisions based off your opponent as well. Just their lines. Like, maybe that was his best place. Like, he just knew he had no counter magic, no interactivity. So, his plan was to beat my face in. But. Uh, hey, sometimes that's the best plan. Yeah. <laughs> But it seems it seemed uh, strange because sometimes, like, I feel like Delver players must bluff a lot. I, I got to uh, think they do. <laughs> yeah, they, they do. Sometimes it's just not worth it to bluff. Like, so for example, if I'm playing against a mono black control player, I'm not gonna bluff if he's got three mana open. Him having three mana open is he's gonna play whatever. He's gonna play whatever he's gonna play. Right, he's gonna try and he's gonna throw a chittering rat out there. So I don't think it's worth bluffing, holding onto that island and blowing it, blown out by a chittering rat. So that's just my theory with how I bluff is, you have to know your opponent. You have to know what they're gonna play into anyway and what they're not. And if your opponent's not gonna, if your opponent's just gonna play whatever he's got anyway, then it's not worth it to bluff. Especially if you bluffing could get you blown out or uh, take away from your outs later on in the game. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that's a, a play decision, right? And sometimes I think that stuff is right or wrong or whatever, but that, that particular situation may not have a right or wrong, but may just be indicative of play style. And so if, if you as the opposing player can pick up on that, like my player is one who will bluff. Like there was not a single turn he didn't have two mana available, and I'm when I duressed him, he had no counter magic in his hand. You know, like, or I, and I was able to land this key creature despite it, which he would have certainly have countered had he had one. Stuff like that. Yeah. And so it's like, if you can pick up on that, that type of stuff, you can start to, to fiddle with your numbers to, to make sure your sideboarding plan is appropriate, not for Delver, but for your opponent who is playing Delver. Uh, so yeah, specific plans, and I think specific plans are things that are going to have to, that's really the culmination of everything that you do with your sideboard. Uh, so, you know, throughout steps one through five here, you figured out what cards are weak, you figured out what cards are good, you figured out general hate cards. And then figuring out the general plan, that's where the real specific number crunching comes down. And this is the only part of the process where you're really changing your main deck to accommodate your side. And sometimes that's what needs to happen, too. So, you know, you figure out that, hey, I want to bring in four Hydroblasts against this deck. But my main deck is so tight that I can't do that. So what I need to do with my main deck to make sure that I can actually hedge up certain matchups... <clears throat> And this is part of where your splitting comes in, too. You hedge certain matchups, and then by play, placing a single dead weight board, and then your your other two dead weights that you want in your 75 go on the sideboard. 
and then they, then you start figuring out what do I take out, what do I bring in for my plan. And I do think it's good to have a general what am I doing sideboard plan. No, you sideboard by feel a lot, but <clears throat> oh, I, that was my my point was that I have general plans. Um, it's it's like ninety percent of the time I'm doing the same thing every time. If that makes sense, but it's the ten percent. <laughs> it's the ten percent of time that I'm pulling against someone that I'm I'm picking up on something. I'm keying into something. That's when I make those changes. So, I I use plans religiously until I key in on something my opponent's doing, or or I don't see a card I need to see before I'm comfortable bringing something in. Yeah, and. Uh, I guess the best example for that of that for you is like Spire Golems, right? You're not gonna bring an artifact hate against Delver player if you don't if you don't see the Spire Golems, are you? No, no, I it's yeah, I would not do that, and it's not until I see something else that I'll bring it in. So like uh, Core Sanctifiers. Last night when my opponent, my mono, my uh, Delver player, he I brought in one Core Sanctifiers because I saw a Spire Golem or two Spire Golems the game before. Figured he was probably on the on the three or four spire golem list, and so I brought in one sanctifier just to like make my my main deck slightly better. And then game two, I saw serrated arrows out of him, so I brought in more sanctifiers. So, uh, and actually, core sanctifiers is really good against Delver. I didn't even realize it because he, he like he just can't get can't attack with ninjas. So I actually just threw those guys out there early and it's pretty sweet yep. but anyways it, oh and he brought in uh curse the chains curse curse the chains yeah, yeah which usually i just don't care about because i'll just uh bounce my own guy but um here's an additional target to consider so yeah i'm taking i'm actually taking curse chains out of my sideboard now i played with two of them in the sideboard and i realized you know snake form is just better i'm just gonna play with snake form i like that too I guess I just don't even understand. Yeah, why that's necessary. I guess it's good against um, crushers. I, I I don't know because I I guess guardian of the guild pact is the old like that's why you play this over narcolepsy, you know. But it's it's like is guardian really that big of a deal for Delver? Uh, he is when he starts wearing both. Okay, that makes sense because then you can't block with the with the spire golems. Okay, I get it. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, I'm just going to play Snake Forms. So, that's my sideboarding advice for everyone right now. Let's just play Snake Forms instead of Curse Chains. At one more mana, the, the format's not fast enough that Curse Chains, that Curse Chains being two more, being uh, one less mana is going to matter. And uh, Snake Form, you can actually get Sliver Stacks with it. So, maybe that's the tech that we need to bring in for Slivers, Snake Forms. That's a really good idea, actually. Because they lose all they lose all creature types and become a snake. That's actually super awesome. Sweet, kind of love snake form. That's like my pet card. And then, <laughs> yeah, that card. Yeah, it's a, snake form is two and a green blue hybrid. Target creature loses all abilities and becomes a one one green snake until end of turn. Draw a card. So I'm playing snake forms. Yeah, that makes sense to me. I think that card's actually pretty insane against. A lot of the decks right now. Yep. Also get to kill mirror enforcers with spell spider sprites. Yeah. We're gonna play Snake Form. Okay, so anyway, I think we're just gonna close this out. Sure, yeah. Um how can we get in contact with you, David? Uh well, you can reach me on Twitter. I'm Shafel at Shafel off of five. Um you can find me on uh MTGO Strat. I write the Thoughtcast articles, uh, or you can find me on Magic Online. I'm Shafel Waffle Five there as well. And I'm Chris. You can contact me on Twitter at cweaver eight five one eight, or on Magic Online at cweaver. I also do videos for the Magic Gathering Strat YouTube channel. My most recent video series was a, a Delver Daily event that I three won. So check those videos out, like them, and share with all your friends. Uh, so until next time, this has been Competitive Poppercast.